Hello, bud. How are you? Good. How you doing? I'm doing well. Of course. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Thank, thanks for being here. I, I see you're you're a busy man. You're on Bar Bend. You're on uh, the Maverick podcast. You know, it's it's um you know it's fun that getting all kind of requests, and of course, it's always fun to kind of speak on it. And of course, this is of course trying me as a hobby, but it's also a passion. So always happy to kind of talk about it, and hopefully to inspire others, and spe- especially of course like all sorts of listeners too. I also did like one in uh an Italian podcast as well, and of course that's. I originally grew up in Italy, so hopefully inspire some more Italian strongmen to come out to uh, compete. Yeah, there, there's a page I, I follow called Strongman Italia. Is that the one? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, you know, that's like the main, it sounds like that's the main federation or that that's the, the guy that runs that runs the Italian federation. Um, but that's I w- the guy I spoke to, I think, competes in that federation. Yeah, I think it, it's a credit to Giants Live that some people don't really realize that there's other federations. Mm-hmm. Like the the Russian ones, the Italian ones. Um, yeah, 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 there's yeah, there's, there's, there's of course kind of quite a few. It's um, of course if you if you get like list all all of them, of course you have, um, of course like in the U.S. you have like United States Strongman, um, of course Strongman Corporation, and now like Strength Fleet um, is in the mix there. And then um, overseas you have Strongman. Champions League, Ultimate Strongman, World Ultimate Strongman, which is two different ones. And then I'm probably, and of course, we were talking about before the Russian Strongman. Um, and then there's always more other ones kind of popping out. So it's, it's yeah, it's pretty exciting that, of course, it seems like all of them are ramping up in terms of making shows bigger and better. So I think some exciting stuff coming. And, you know, like the Arnold, too. That's a, oh, yeah. I think it's, I think it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a big, yeah, that's, I think the biggest sports festival in the world now. Yeah. Arnold. So, well, the Arnold has um, more athletes than the Olympics uh, at its peak. At its peak, it had, we're still, let's say pre-COVID, right, ha- had more athletes um, than the Olympics. Yeah, I think it's 330 sports, something like that, something, some some ridiculous number. Of course. I would, I would probably say, like, and again, like, uh, there's a lot of, like, individual. Like, of course, I got invited there to go as an amateur. So, of course, like, Olympics definitely has probably more higher – higher caliber athletes but the Arnold's definitely has again has that number had those numbers yeah the the pro card pro circuit thing is it's a it's a tricky thing especially with uh middleweights mm-hmm. right you know what so I guess you have your pro card right yes yeah I got, I got my pro card back in 2015 okay so how'd, how'd you earn that um so that was through strongman corporation and that was like a platinum plus so that was um there were about like 30, about 30 guys or so. And at the time they were run like a platinum plus a year, like probably like mostly like one, one a year that you're eligible to kind of win your pro card. Um, and that one was out in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania and the, and the events lined up well. So I, of course I, I hopped in and of course had a good result that day. Also there was at the time there were two pressing events. So I thought it would be a great, great way to kind of showcase my ability. So I kind of lucked out in the event choosing. Yeah, because there's there's a lot of people at the world level who don't have pro cards, right? I mean, like OSG, you don't have to be a pro to compete there. Not necessarily, yeah. So um, again, you can always kind of kind of hop in, um, but for the, a lot of times is that that you know, again, I think the common trend is that um, those individuals that have gone out and, saw, and 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 sought after those pro cards are generally the ones that are like the the top of the podium. So like for instance, Clash of the Coast, um, there are, I think we only had. Um, like three pros in the actual final, so three out of eleven individuals, but all three of those pros were at the top of the podium. Um, and then one of the first times we had between like Giants Live and OSG, um, so I've competed. I competed in Belfast one year, and then the year after was in North Carolina when the the official Strongman Games officially hosted all the different weight classes. Um, and of course, you had a number of individuals compete there, but the that year in 2017, the podium was all, pro, all American strong American corporation or strongman corporation pros. So, so for the most part, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a pro to compete at those top level shows. However, generally, a lot of times the pros, especially the the, the top level, the pros are generally the ones you're going to see uh, more common than not, just because they're always um, I, I think out there kind of proving themselves. And of course, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. So I was speaking with. Oh, sorry, I think your sound. Oh, your sound's back. Uh, I was speaking with a woman named Nadia Stowers last week, and she doesn't Ooh, have cool. a pro card. 
but she says, but she set four world records as an amateur in official competitions and they're, they're legitimate. They're not gym lifts, mm -hmm. but it, it's interesting seeing that discrepancy between, you know, she, she is a legitimate strong woman, but she, she's not, doesn't have that piece of paper that says she is, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th and I think she's going to, I think she's going to go out there and compete and, and go get the pro card. But there's, a, I was, there's only a couple organizations. I know of course some, some other groups outside of uh, strongman corporation are ramping up to do, um, more pro events. Um, but I think it does, it's really being a pro is really what it, kind of way you make it out to be right. Again, if some guys will get a pro card and stop competing, so they don't really, really push the, the whole kind of professional status. And some guys will go out and will get the pro card and really, and really, and I think maybe like maybe speak of myself, but really treat that as kind of, um, I would say in terms of, really going out there and really feeling like a professional and treating you in like everything you do in terms of your training, your, your diet, your competing and really make, making that being a true professional in that sense. And again, um, so I, again, to get back to where you mentioned, I think it's really kind of where you make, where you make it out to be. But um, I think, yeah, again, not, I think Nadia has the talent, but there's only, of course, there's only one contest for in some, in some respects, there's only one or two contests to actually earn your pro card at that time. Um, so I'm seeing, of course, I think with kind of strongman corporation, I think we're, we're seeing like, I think potentially for like their America's strongest woman, I think there's going to be like special invites for you know, those notable people, like potentially like a Nadia or something like that to go and compete, um, with the strongest woman because they have earned their respect, but they, uh, but unfortunately they haven't quite, um, gone and done, went through the channels in terms of win a local show, place top three at strongman nationals and then of course receive the card that way um but again yeah nadia definitely has that strength but um but her, her uh overhead um her records are all in are they all in overhead or is it because she had, of course the block yeah i think they're all in overhead l2 the what the, the circus stuff. so it would be block axle log and then dumbbell i don't know if she she might have the dumb. I'm actually not sure if she has a dumbbell one. It might be that she set an open record and a middleweight record. That might be how it's for. Yeah, that, that, that's true. I think that might be what it is. Very impressive. But, all the less. So I know she's going to be at, at uh, official strongman game. So yeah. we make a run to run for the podium. Yeah. And well, speaking on that professionalism, I really, as, as a, as a fan of the sport, I really like what strength lead has done for like clash on the coast. You know, I'm, I'm sure that has a special place in your heart because you won it. <laughs> But, you know, that's it's the first televised middleweight strongman show and you're putting up numbers. Let's see, your axle was 418, I believe, 419? Uh, 417. 417, okay. Um, there are a lot of pros who can't hit that and compete at the world level. Um, so the, you guys definitely have the ability and it's, it. well, I guess the, the way I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's not boring watching lightweight or middleweight strongman, which uh, some people accuse it of being like, oh, well, it's not the same kind of weights. It's pretty close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I think we're right. And then a lot of times it's, you also have that combination between like strength and speed. Um, so even at the maybe the top five guys in each event is going to be moving pretty well. Um, and when we talk about, um, yeah, again, the, the axles, of course, up there, I think the – uh, the record that I think Eddie Hall holds the heavyweight record. So, two sixteen. What say again? Two sixteen. Two sixteen so, is the kilos. I think it's four seventy three. Yes. All right. So I would say roughly like like fifty sixty pounds difference. Um, and again, that potential in the middleweight could be pushed, but the heavyweight number could be pushed. Um, so again, I think we're getting getting a little kind of closer to um, that. But again, it's this the fact that strength was able to kind of highlight that skill and, and kind of show the world that what we could do in that fashion and, and compete can do the heavyweights. And again, that's doing like the 600 pound squad in the qualifiers doing um, heavy car deadlifts. And again, the, um, a, 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 a stiff frame, like the big dog frame that we use with the challenger is no easy task. So that was, I was say again, that was, that was kind of quite difficult. Um, but it's, yeah, it's great that we, of course, being kind of highlighting. I think this is something that a lot of the fans and a lot of the people in the strongman community have been hungry for is that not only uh, a showcase is, is, is showcasing outside of just the heavyweights and again, getting into the, the weight classes. So I hope 
hope this opened the doors for, for more opportunities for not only middleweights, but for, maybe for some lightweights and then, of course, some of the women classes as well. Yeah, I mean, if, and also, if you look at some of the middleweight records, I know Luke Davies pulled 420, 420 mm -hmm. kilos when he was a, a middleweight. Um, that's Novikov's best deadlift as well. And he's, you know, he's one world's strongest man. So that's, you, you're really right there. And with Eddie's axle record, you know, you, you, you weigh in at 231, he weighed in at 435. Mm -hmm. So yeah. at, at 200 pounds lighter than him, um, you were only 50 pounds apart in pressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it is close. Um, so I, I, again, it's great that they, they, they we're highlighting and really kind of showing that. Um, and then, of course, with more opportunities, what else can, what more can we show? And again, be, being close and hopefully it's not, I think in the end, it's not going to be, and I can something that no, not that we're afraid of, but like heavyweights thinking that like we're taking the spotlight away from. If anything, we're going to add more. Everybody wants to see, of course, kind of what we can do, and then kind of see like what the head, the unlimiteds can do as well. So I think it's going to bring more more attention, not to the not to the weight class in general, but to the to the sport in general as well. Yeah, I mean, well, most people when they lift weights and try to get big, they'll get more like your size than an Eddie Hall or or a half Thor, you know. The, the average gym goer isn't going to break 250 for, you know, if they're, they're fun and lifting recreationally, if they're, if they're looking for an outlet, you know, they might, they might push it and stuff like that. But most people, when they get big, they get up to around 220, 230, depending on their height. So it's much more, or, you know, even the shorter guys like Tommy Lavelle or uh, Naramu Ahipen, you know, they, that you guys are sort of someone people could legitimately strive to be like, as opposed to, you know, I'm not going to be 440 pounds. It's it's just not going to happen. Um, so I'm not sure if you ever look at like the Strongman Corporation just attends attendance for nationals or even in the past. Um, but yet, even since I started in like 2012, 2013, and competed in nationals the first few years um, of my career, the middleweight and let's just say that when we talk about middleweight strongman, so the 231s and the 200 class. So of course they have the sub like for. Um, the way they did the awards, they would do a subclass, but we generally were group in, grouped in together. And we were always the big, the 231s and the 200s together were always the biggest weight class at every national. And this is between men and women. So we're gonna, you're seeing that most people that lift are identified more as with the middleweights rather than kind of heavyweights. And again, the biggest attendance numbers within strongman across, I would say across probably the, the US definitely and probably across the world is again with 105 kilos rather than the kind of heavyweight. So it's the most competitive weight class of, of all. So I think, again, kind of catering to that, I think we'll bring other individuals that could be um, a good setup and or, or be interested in, again, kind of competing. Again, a lot of times, and I get this question all the time, and people ask me, it's like, oh, there's weight classes within Strongman. And, and again, everybody always thinks it's just a super heavyweight. So I think, again, bring more awareness to that. We'll bring more um, individuals into the sport. Yeah, like for, for me, I... I compete in, in local shows, but I'm lightweight, uh, novice. There's like 30 guys in my division. <laughs> it's because most people if, as novices are under 220. And it's, it, it's definitely that accessibility that you guys and strength lead as a whole is, is, is helping people with. Um, so what got you into this whole uh, strong man scene? Originally it was, uh, my bodybuilding coach. Uh, back in 2012, so I, of course I um, enrolled into kind of a bodybuilding kind of kind of workshop. So we meet like like we meet like probably like biweekly, and then we had different tasks that we were learning. But I was pretty much kind of learning how to be like a natural bodybuilder. And uh, a month into the program, um, I got introduced to strongman. So we did a strongman training day, and a week week and a half later, we did a, a strongman contest. And then from there. I was kind of I was kind of hooked. Was like, well, I really enjoyed this, and then learning more about bodybuilding and posing and stuff like that, which was great and all, but I didn't think it was quite the right fit. And I just I like the subjective strength and subjective numbers, of like whoever lifts the most wins and things like that, but rather than someone judging in terms of like what's their opinion in terms of who's the has the best physique or who has who's the best poser. Um, so once we so once I got the exposure to strongman, then I then um, I said that I was gonna pursue strongman and of course kind of forgo uh bodybuilding but again i got that course was great because i got to learn a lot of um a lot of different items when it comes to of course good train uh, good training methods good diet stretching mobility and things like that so i carry that into 
why I do strongman. But yeah, originally it was through a bodybuilding coach. Yeah, I, I, I get that. It kind of, no one can take away from you the fact that you put 417 over your head. It's not really at the, it's not subjective. You know, it, it, was, it either got pressed or it didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So I guess, what ways do you try to help out in your performance? Do you have a coach? Do you do nutrition, physio, those kind of things? I, I would say I, I do everything. So uh, coaching, coaching wise, I have I have more guys I've kind of like consult with. Um, I've had a coach. I've had coaches in the past, and of course, they done a good job programming me. And I generally take what I like about their programming and put it into my current program and what I did, and I leave out. Um, so in the in the past, when it comes to like coaching programming. Um, I've had coaches, but right now I, I pretty much do my own program in that sense. And then of course consult others, but I really, of course, you always have to focus on like all facets of the, um, of the game. So of course that, that that's, it's training. It's like, of course you're, this is like, again, back to programming to technique, diet, um, recovery is huge. I think that's something that a lot of individuals don't take into consideration is that you have to work as hard off the field as you do on the field. So of course going you talking before physio um going to Cairo, getting body work done and then some sort of fashion when it comes to like maybe like uh heat and cold um training so if that's um ice bath if that's sauna if that's a combination of both that's always something that's um i think pretty useful and then even working in like active recovery days and doing those little workouts that are not too fun but again it's something that's important um in the past i've had to i did fix different items I had like I used to have like an interior tilt where my pelvic was was facing downward so my quads were very tight my hamstrings were very weak and then my lower abs were weak and my upper, my lower back was super tight and weak so I had to like fix that in order to like really fix my deadlift and um, fix my form um, in general so um, that was very kind of important to um, kind of fix but I again you gotta you gotta focus on everywhere but probably starting out I always focus on technique and then as I got older I incorporate, incorporate diet but there's always somewhere there's always somewhere you can kind of improve and, and again be able to get better and stronger um, depending on the next challenges that, or contests that you have ahead of you and so I've, I've been watching you for a couple of years with the tsunami bar and I, I remember when you got when you got the, the sponsorship with that how, how much do you think that has affected that sort of unstable uh, training because I've seen Julius Maddox uh, when he's training for bench press, he'll he'll train with like the uh, earthquake bar, like the the bamboo mm -hmm. um, one. So would you say that has given you sort of a not not necessarily a unique advantage, but it's more of a training tool that not a lot of other people have figured out how to use, and it's it's kind of helped you get ahead. So I think that's ex exactly it's the it's the tra training tool is the best way to kind of describe it. So it's not it's not going to re re replace a straight bar. Uh, but it's a great way to work it in. A lot of times it's worked in in my accessories, and then I probably use it as my main lift towards the closer I get to to a, a contest. So I'll, I'll really, for instance, like pound like the straight bar work or like presses off the blocks, and then to work the speed and work the reinforcement of form and work the stability, I'll really I'll, I'll work up on the tsunami bar. And I did that leading up to the clash and also leading up to. Um, my last show in Russia where I really kind of would use that in my last week or two uh, to really kind of clean up things. But again, it's a, um, it's either sometimes, sometimes it's a main lift, but it's generally it's an accessory, accessory lift. And again, it's just to kind of help polish, but also challenge you in a different way. Um, and again, you can't always do this kind of like the same thing day in and day out. So some sort of stability work really um, helps out. So I've noticed when you clean and press with a straight bar, you sometimes put the the plates closer to the end to create a little more whip. Does that, do you find it's easier to press with the whip or without the whip? Because I know the axle you pressed to clash was fixed axle. So, right? yeah, so that was a fixed axle, but that was a little more of a practice of um, that particular item. And I think I got that back from kind of like a Olympic lifting methods. Um, but that's a good piece in terms of um, teaching yourself how to push yourself under the bar. So you get a little bit of that, for instance, when you're doing like a jerk, most likely, and you wouldn't really feel that in a push press. But when you're doing a jerk, power jerk, or um, like let's say a push jerk, you get that point where you're uh, pushing yourself on the bar. So the bar goes weightless at some point. So having the bars, having the weight on the end really kind of teaches you, uh, you feel more of that weightlessness 
um, in the bar so you can really focus up on pushing yourself under when you push yourself under you're in that strong base so of course you're you're flexing all the way from your toes all the way up to like upper body so your hamstring your core is tight and then you're really in that position where you're put you're pushing yourself up up and push push again push yourself on the bar you're not just put you're not just pressing it and splitting it um so that's that was a good uh practice in that and then the tsunami and then of course back to the tsunami bar that's something that's another reason why i like it when i say it reinforcement and form you can really get that that feeling of pushing yourself on the bar and practicing pushing yourself on the bar with something like a tsunami bar so someone that's really pushing the jerks or pushing um again a power jerk or a push jerk it's again it's a good training in that sense uh and that's why i like it especially if i'm training split jerks so Obviously, you have to be strong in body, but what does your mindset look like going into a big show? I mean, you were with with Anthony Deal out. You were very much the heavy favorite going into Clash. I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of pressure like that. That's no disrespect to mm. you on that, by the way. I just I, I know he won America's Strongest Man, so he was um, sort of on that on that pedestal. But what what kind what did that pressure look like, and how do you so, deal with it going into it? So. Um, how did I deal with Anthony Deal? No, I was kidding. Um, you know, it was interesting because I, of course, Anthony was a strong competitor. Um, but I think my, the, the events in the finals favored myself. Again, we both had to get into the, the finals. And if he, if he showed up with the, that, that changed the roster a little bit, maybe, but, um, but for the most part, I think that it would, we're, we're like one and one. So we're, again, I, I, I think really depending on like the setup of the, the events, I think it could go e either way. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, but it was, it was too bad. Cause I, again, I, I wanted to compete them. I and right now we're one and one in terms of like competitions against each other. So this would have been like a, a tiebreaker or the, or the third one, but in terms of, um, of course after, and then I was, of course, it's kind of like a, kind of the clear, maybe like favorite, um, it's really just focusing on what you need to do because before of any contest, before you, um, even compete, you, you have to, or when you're competing, it's like, of course you want to win, you want podium, you want to do well, but you really have to focus on beating yourself first. You, and if you don't beat yourself, you're not going to beat others. Um, so in that portion, um, you, I really had to uh, make sure I'm focusing on, I'm hitting, doing everything like them right up the day. So like pretty much checking all the boxes in every training. So that's like, for instance, like focusing on the programming and hitting the goals for every day. And then of course, getting the right amount of sleep. And, um, and then once you're able, and then if I'm checking all those boxes, if I'm of course hitting the training numbers, that builds the confidence that I'm able to kind of ride into um, the contest. But like, for instance, if I missed those training sessions or I wasn't good on my diet or I was a little off, that would probably make me a little nervous. But again, if I'm able to, um, again, just, and this is probably my, I think Clash was like, it, in my mid thirties in terms of the amount of contests I've done. Um, so I know that if I, if I do X, Y, and Z, I'll be very confident in that I can carry that into the, into the, into the show. Um, so th there was some pressure, but I had, a, I had one of my best preps ever. So I was very kind of excited uh, to compete. Interesting. And, and you, you hold back a lot of footage when you're training. <laughs> I've, I've noticed that you, you'll post, you know, class training dump or the, the Russia, the Russian show. Do you think that is a sort of a mental thing you have in your back pocket? Like, all right, I know I did this amount of weight, even if other people don't know it. Do you think yeah. it's? You know? Yeah, I, I would say de de uh, definitely. And then, of course, sometimes, like for instance, like other lifts where I might be a little more like comparable. Um, like for instance, if it was like a deadlift or like throwing or something like that, I don't want to motivate people. I don't want to put out videos and motivate people to work even harder, right? It's like, for instance, uh, like, I don't know if you're a big fan of the New England Patriots, but be, me and being in Boston, I'm a big fan of the Patriots. And generally, Bill Belichick used to go out and find things that the other team says about the Patriots to motivate their team. And then they would get, and then of course that helps them with the game on the game day on Sunday. And then of course, if, if a certain, like, and that's why Bill Belichick never has, most of his players talk to the media because they don't want to motivate teams to of course beat them on Sunday. So I, I always say, so I like, so for depending on the event, I don't want to give reasons. I don't want to give reasons why to motivate people in um, to motivate people um, in the contest. So that's generally why sometimes I hold back uh, videos, but also some of the videos I do post, even if it's it looks like I do it that day, sometimes it could be from a week or two weeks before. Um, 
but I generally always showcase the pressing because um, if I'm confident in my pressing, I, I feel like it doesn't really matter what I post. Like, I don't know if you're going to beat me in the press. And then sometimes if it's the stones, like, yeah, you can know, you can know that I'm good at stones, um, but it's the last event. So by the time we get to the last event, there's ready, you're ready to know where you are in the kind of the point standing. So like, for instance, it's just like, for it's like Tom stole, you know, that Tom Stolman's going to win the stones no matter what in the, for the heavyweights. But like it's the the question is like well, how is the other training is going and you got to figure out where you can see. But like for instance, if Tom Stillman said like oh I'm really good at right now like because he, he killed like, almost all the events like especially like the fr the the first event in the finals which was a um, frame carry I think he came in dead last in 2020 on the on the um, Hercules the no. What's the, it was the yeah Hercules all, yeah the Her Stolmans aren't known so, for their grip strength. The grip, so his grip strength, he really went from last to first, right, in in a matter of year. So mm -hmm. people can again, if um, if he was showcasing that uh, grip strength, it might have pushed the other uh, competitors to really work on their grip grip strength. But he kept that in his back pocket. It sounded like because I had no clue he was gonna come out and destroy everybody in the in the grip strength. But even though he did well in the qualifiers, but prior to the actual contest. You didn't. Know, you you would think that grip was something there. So sometimes you you got to figure out what you want to kind of showcase. And sometimes it's just just a matter of just kind of like almost like an Instagram strategy, just stocking up on content and then just and then kind of just dumping at the right times. Well, I think for someone like you, I think you actually benefited a little bit from not being featured on World's Ultimate Strongman. Like I know you strength leads doing the Log Press Championship, but mm -hmm. someone like Luke Stoltman who is a great all-around competitor kind of might be rude kind of wasted his 2020 going for the log record because it, it definitely it looked like it brought down his other stuff and so the 2020 world strongest man he was kind of pretty good and then by the time 21 rolled around he was training everything equally and you saw a noticeable change in his performance so someone like you who could maybe be labeled a pressing specialist you don't necessarily get singled out for that in competitions. Like, you know, aside from this, the log championship, you know, it's, it's not going to be the, the Nick Camby Axel show. It's going to be the clash on the coast where you have to win multiple events. And I think you're able to train for that better than uh, someone like Luke was when he was just focusing on the log. That, you know, that, that's a good point because that's kind of similar to like the deadlift specialist too, right? Yeah. Sometimes they spend all the time deadlifting, um, and then they're not necessarily some of the best deadlifters now. I think a lot of them are going for to break that deadlift record are not necessarily big strongman household names because the household names are competing all the time. So they're training all the events and it takes really taxing just to train one event and train it to like the utmost efficiency and, um, of course, potential. So for the most part, I would say that, um, yeah, it's, it's really, t I think, yeah, I think you're, you're spot on that Luke really hurt, kind of hurt himself always working on that log because again once you you're always constantly in the 500s really does kind of burn you tax tax you out burn you out from other uh, event training so so when you're not working on strength lead or training to be one of the best in the world uh what's your day job mm. so i'm a recruiter for financial and commodity trading um so either like banks asset manager hedge funds generally work with them in terms of um all sorts of roles but generally either support roles or trading roles do, do people ever ask you about strongman while you're there uh a, a little bit um and sometimes i of course kind of work it in in terms of kind of what i'm like introduce myself in terms of um again just like kind of the whole just kind of personally so of course this is what i do of course what i do during nine to five and then outside of that of course, I focus on strongman, but generally my go my kind of my my goal right now is to be the best recruiter and best strongman that I can be. And I think they both kind of play into each other. And there's times where I can focus more on strongman, but there's times where I focus more on recruiting. Um, but I think kind of the two will kind of play into each other. But um, I do enjoy doing both. Interesting, because I know a lot of people in especially strongman, I guess I'll, I'll go back to the Stoltmans. Mm -hmm. They kind of work at strongman so they don't have to work their day job anymore. It seems like you like your, your job, right? Mm -hmm. it, I guess, is that not really a goal of yours? You want to keep, keep doing both? Well, it's, it, it, so it's a matter of, I think it's something that I've developed. And again, it's a, it's more of kind of like a business that I've 
recruiting is definitely you kind of build your own business. So it's like, for instance, if I decide to take time off, time off, I'm taking I'm, I'm taking away potential time from my business. But if I, I can always potentially like ramp it down or ramp it up depending on what I want. So there's a lot of flexibility to, towards it. And then of course with strongman, again, there's gonna I think there's gonna be way more opportunities going forward. But in the last five years or so, it's it's not something that you can just totally focus on and totally get by. And I, and I have other goals in terms of I was like buying another house and um, and of course just and of course just um, setting myself up for the future and potentially like uh, start a bit, start other businesses. But of course, it's strongman is great. Um, but again, I think I have to do a focus. And again, there's always the opportunity. There was the piece where what happens if I get hurt and I can't compete for a while? I can always, while I'm recovering, I can always focus on recruiting. And and what happens if I if I do get hurt and not get hurt, but if, if I stop strongman, is like if, if have I done enough in the strongman realm to, of course, keep that for a living until I'm in, in the 70s? So I think right now it, I do enjoy being attached to like the so I'm attached to the financial markets, and of course that's what I studied back in college. Um, so again, it, it keeps it keeps my involvement there. But again, I'm able to kind of do both, and they both kind of play into each other. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't want to disparage his name, but you really don't want to end up like Andrew Clayton. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I love the guy; he's a, he's a great competitor. But he spent the past two years just crawling his way out of that that first injury, then the second, the third, and the, the surgery, and that surgery. It's it's you, as, no matter how good you are, it's good to have that that kind of fallback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Clay, Clayton's very intense. I think it's it's uh, it's tough. Maybe maybe he's watching this today. Maybe he's not. Maybe watch it later. Um, but I I think what's tough with with his recovery is everybody told him to stop at Giants Live after he tore his ACL, but he had to finish the contest because he had to show how tough he is. But he maybe he could have set himself back maybe five, three or four, six months because he had to show everybody how tough a guy he was and further and further damage his knee. So that's not something I would do. I think there's a like there's there's sometimes there's a line of like what what you should do and what you shouldn't. Um, but again, you got you got to ride or die by the the decisions that you made. Um, but it, again, you do you do have to have. Um, I would say like a strong everything in within strong man. It has to be strong. It has to be strong, right? So like if you have a a poor foundation. So like again, if you're great a strong man, but you have a poor personal life, that eventually your your personal life will take over and you're not going to be able to compete in strongman one way or the other. So again, develop, having, having that balance between personal life and strongman, I think is very important. And it, again, it's especially if you want to stay healthy and keep competing and keep, keep doing it. And then, um, but yeah, but, but I've had this goal of just, I would say of the, the dual paths for, for many years right now. And so far it's, I would say kind of working out and knock on wood, hopefully it keeps continuing and the success keeps rolling in. I hope so for you. And Andrew, if you're watching, please don't be mad at me. I'm just using you as an example. I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, so I guess you've been doing this for the past 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. Would you say that lifting as a whole, not just strongman, but the bodybuilding, anything you might've done before that, has, has it had positive impacts on you? Something that maybe you wouldn't have been able to learn in a classroom or something, you know, life skills you, you picked up in, in the weight room? Absolutely. So I think it comes down to, I think one piece would be like mental toughness. Um, so in terms of like, for instance, you want, you would have certain goals. Um, but a lot of times, especially with, I think a little more of like, not so much the weight room, but more competing. There's like, for instance, so you go in the gym and you go work out because you want to be strong. But if you're competing and you want to be the best or you want to win the contest, you don't necessarily, you don't go to the gym because you want to be strong. You go to the gym because you need to. I think once you kind of learn that background in terms of um, or, or learn that kind of thought of like putting yourself not necessarily in a want situation, but in a need situation, that's where you really start focusing and really put everything all in. But like, for instance, I've it's funny because in, uh, in college I used to wrestle and I used to cut weight all the time. It wasn't my favorite. But like I, you would get through the weight cuts, be, and then of course you had to be super mentally tough. You couldn't eat. You had to, you had to operate off like low calories and low water all the time. And then that's similar kind of what happens now with uh, weight cuts for uh, strongman. But I would say again, if you, I, you stay mentally tough, and again you're doing it towards a big goal. So I think at times it really keeps you kind of disciplined, and then you can bring that discipline to other ways. So again, if I bring that discipline to recruiting or some other 
areas of my life. Um, but I would say definitely it's just strongman is another kind of metaphor for life in terms of like challenges and obstacles and it, it's never going to go your way, but the more time that you spend in, into it and the more time you can, again, kind of stay healthy, then you can really bring out opportunities and that's, that can be applied towards anything going forward. Yeah. And I actually did wrestling in high school as well. So I, they, they never cared enough about me to make me cut weight. I wasn't good enough, but I, I saw the guys who did it and it, it looked brutal. No, oh, but speaking, speaking of cutting weight, you know, most middleweight guys, I assume you're around, the, you're the same way. Don't walk around at 231 pounds. You know, maybe, maybe Tyler Young does, <laughs> but, um, you know, why, why keep forcing yourself into a middleweight class? If say, I don't know what you walk around at, say it's 260, 270. Why not be like uh, someone like Kevin Ferris and just go up? Cause he's competing at 285. Mm. at worlds why why stay at this size so um to answer your or just the first so right now i've been walking around probably in the last year or so i've walked around anywhere from 245 to 50 to 255 before a contest like or like before america's strongest man um uh, before class before russia um and i would say that if i can get if i can start my weight cut between 245 and 248 i'm, I'm gonna do a water cut i'm in pretty good shape too kind of perform well um and for the most part why don't i kind of jump up to another weight class then i think again i'm, I'm facing a new set of challenges um and again it's not that's not necessarily more competitive but given my given that i'm not a smaller frame but again smaller frame compared to the the other guys i'm gonna have to take three or four years of of, of, of competing and and working hard probably Potentially like working harder because again it's going to be different challenges than at 231 to become a, I was a kind of a top level and then um, for myself you're taking up that much more risk in terms of other areas um, but I always saw like 105 kilo as a, of a class again I do enjoy staying lean um, and I, I, again I, I do just see that a lot of the, a lot of competitiveness within the class so that's why I've always why I, I always wanted to kind of stay in this class. Um, I think potentially, actually, in the in the past, I've thought about going to the heavyweights, but again, it just you can again take on a lot of loads, and you're at, and you're potentially asking for uh, more serious injury. And again, my I think a, the reason why I've been one of the, I think one of the top reasons why I've been so successful at this point is that I've been able to stay healthy um, relatively. I've had I think one, I had one knee surgery during the span, which was for a repair of meniscus from my wrestling days. Uh, but besides that, I've had like very minor nicks and knacks of, of competing. So um, going up an extra level is just, again, another another level of commitment. Um, could that take away from my personal life potentially? Um, could that take away from other areas? Um, but it's just, it's a, another level of risk and a, another, another challenge that I'm not sure if that's gonna be quite, but I think there's more opportunity and there's more um a kind of a more or a more attractive opportunity to stick out with the 105s and become that trailblazer um because generally for instance everybody remembers like kind of like the first person to to do what so i, I think again this is the first time espn is going to be or first time 105s are going to be on espn so i think i think of 105 kilo as nick can be going forward again that'd be that'd be neat that'd be great but again if you could keep staying in that kind of trailblazer so like very similar to Kind of Rich Froning. Rich Froning won all those um, a CrossFit championships when he first started out. And when you think of CrossFit, you think of Rich Froning, right? So I, I hope to one day think of like when you think of 105 kilo strongman in America, you think of Nicholas Camby. So I think there's more value in that than than kind of not selling. Now I'm not saying I'm being a seller, but selling out and going to the heavyweights. That's, um, that makes sense. I mean, you, I, there's a guy uh, in England. I don't know if you know him. His name is Dale McPherson. He's competed at the Arnold. You, you know Dale? I do not know Dale. Okay, he uh, his Instagram is three D strength if that narrows it down at all. Um, but he's the first ninety kilo guy to pull four times body weight, wow. and it's he's taking from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty two to go up to one hundred five from ninety kilos. I mean, some of that is you know the pandemic and he couldn't compete in anything, but he 
what exactly what you're describing is those two years, I guess almost three years of just grafting away and just getting bigger and putting on the size and getting the strength there. But then again, he also doesn't have a job outside the gym. He runs the gym that he trains at and he, he owns that place. So he's just there constantly um, running the gym, training his clients and training himself. So that there's definitely, I, I see your point really in that if you want to maintain that, that dual, um, that dual life, then it, it, it would probably be excessive to, to move up a weight class. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that, I think, again, just, I think there's a lot of opportunity, 105 kilos, um, going forward. And even I had that, had a conversation with, uh, Mikhail Kaklaev out in, in, when I was out, we we're out in Russia, he said that the, he thinks that the future of strongman is within the 105. There's a lot of opportunity with 105 kilos. So, um, I, I can see myself being a kind of a lifer and potentially being just hopefully one of the innovators within the, um, within this, uh, weight class. Yeah, and, and also, you know, not, not to discredit you, but not everyone is super successful when they move up. Mm -hmm. Uh, like when, when Furman competed as a heavyweight, he didn't do great at the Arnold or at the, I, I, I think it was an equipment test or Giants Live. I don't think he competed there. Um, but at the Arnold, he, he competed, but he didn't do like amazing. Um, but the people, so the weight, yeah. like for instance, like the weight jumps was, a, was a lot for his knee. Right. Um, and for instance, going from running a 900 yoke super fast to, to running 1100 yoke, that extra 200 pounds, um, pretty much the same frame is, is again, it's a lot for the joints, a lot for the ligaments and the muscles to handle. So I think, again, if he took the, if he took the time away from competition and maybe and spent a year or two, but again, he wants to, he wanted to compete in now. So, and then like the opportunity was now, so he, again, he kind of jumped into, but yeah, it's to your point, um, it, it you are it is a it is another challenge just you gotta going from right from 105 right into the heavyweights and yeah and, and some not all yeah not everybody has success doing it and that's that's what's interesting even watching people scale down into 105s uh like i know ben thompson was in this uh it, uh live stream i don't know if he's still here watching his transition the uh thunder bay deadlift king um, go from I think he's three ten at his heaviest, and now he's now he's a middleweight, but still extremely competitive. And and watching Clayton make that transition as well. Um, it, but the reason why they're so notable is because they're so rare. Those jumps between weight classes, whether they're well, I guess if you're jumping up or jumping down, and not everyone can do it. And if and if you can be a trailblazer in what is considered the future of strongman, then why why risk that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, of course, I want to, I you know, that in Clash was only my first win after six years in, as being a pro. So, of course, I, I had a lot of notable um, contests and a lot of podiums, but I just ne I never, I, I was just always struggling to get to the top of the podium. So, of course, while I'm here, I want to I want to spend some time at the top. So that's, of course, that was my goal, too. So I guess speaking of goals, what do you have planned for yourself in the future? You mentioned buying a, a new house, and mm -hmm. so, so that's more of a personal goal. So I guess what, what kind of personal and strongman-related goals? I assume you want to win OSG. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you came second. So that's, that's uh, gotta hurt. So, yeah, so strongman-wise, um, I would say so. Con let's just, we'll start with the contests. Um, so I think right now I'm lined up for. Um, of course, the max log uh, September fourth. There'll also be a max block, so I'll probably attempt that uh, on the same day. Um, there's a, another event that's supposed to be announced soon. Um, that will be two weeks after that um, down down the south, um, and that will be another kind of 105 kilo show. So there's still more details to become out. So can't speak on it too much, but I think that will be another kind of great uh, opportunity, another um, high exposure show. And then of course there's OSG. So this is OSG would be my fourth worlds. Um, so I've came in sixth, second, and fifteenth one year. So of course now I do want to go um, again. That's kind of something that I do want. Um, there's America's Strongest Man. I'm still I'm still debating if I'm gonna hop into that. And um, that's late September just because I'm doing all the events in the fall. Um, and then there is also um, I might do a Max Stone in December as long as I'm healthy. Um, 
in mid mid December, um, and I think that's probably like a strength lead, and then there will be a bunch of other um, individuals as well. Um, I'm gonna start um, ramping up my YouTube. I had I started YouTube back in college, back in 2010, but um, and I've posted videos, and I used to do a lot of editing and stuff like that. But um, I'm gonna start kind of ramping my my YouTube for like some training days and some instructional videos. Um, so I have the kind of the goal there, and then um, and then. I'm hoping um, to get probably just get more outside kind of like sponsors into the world of kind of strongman just so maybe like large corporations are not interested in strongman now or or prior but that would get get into it so I'm hoping that they'll be able to again kind of connect it but again just be a good ambassador for the sport um, kind of going going forward so for right now I would say those are probably I would say kind of all all kind of my goals going forward and what I want to put out and um, and, and hoping to potentially do some seminars as well down the road. Um, but it's, yes, I think slowly they'll all come together, but as long as I can kind of keep up the success and keep up the training, um, I think there's a lot of good things will come about if I, again, if I work hard. Do you think you can eclipse someone like Furman? I'm not, I'm not saying that to set up a rivalry between the two of you, but you know, the, the way he's been on the Titan games, two times world champion competed at Arnold's, founded strength lead with you know pe- people like do you do you think you could see yourself in that sort of ambassador role of middleweight strongman uh, but, uh potentially I, I would like to i would want to do it in a different fashion um so again it would be like diff- different avenues that would, again helps kind of explore the sport but I, I think i can definitely be on that um same level maybe when we talk about potentially kind of strongman i, I would i would say um yeah, hopefully, I, I think I, I get to the point where I'm. Hopefully, I have more world titles. If he comes back to compete, hopefully we get to compete against each other. But I hope to get to the point where I have maybe more accolades than him. I think that would be that's always a great goal. Not necessarily. I'm always kind of competing against everyone, so I think that would be a goal myself. But um, I wouldn't want to necessarily want to do kind of like the same things. But I hope to go in different avenues and kind of be my own, kind of own trailblazer anywhere else, but be on that same level. That definitely would be a goal of mine. And he's a definitely a big influence, a good, good, great friend of mine, but also a great influence on me too. Yeah. That, uh, again, that's, that's not anything against Furman. I'm just, you know, when you have two top level guys, comparisons will come. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess wrapping things up here, I have one final thing to ask you. And that's probably one of my favorite things to ask. So if you could go back to a young 18 year old, Nick Canby, mm-hmm. starting out on the wrestling team, maybe um, what, what would you kind of tell yourself in terms of life, lifting, study, finance, maybe switch to an English major. Cause it's better. I don't know. You know, something like that. Mm. I was, I was say depending on what, what you've uh, depending on when, I would ask myself the question if I asked myself that question like two or two or three years ago or earlier, I, I, I would almost might not tell him anything because he might go on a different direction. Um, I, I would most likely I would have maybe gone to I think I would have gone to a probably diff, a different college uh, in the long run. But I'm but again I'm glad I, I chose the college I did and met the friends I did and had the experiences that we went through together. Um, but I probably would have went a different direction. But like I, again I. I might just said that just say always just say keep keep working hard, um, and I would say potentially yeah don't be don't be afraid to kind of chase the goals and then I think that's something that I probably realized probably like later um, probably maybe in my mid twenties where maybe I was going out to the bars and out to the clubs and I was really like oh this is all fun but this doesn't really help me towards my end goal of of being a great strong man or be, being a great businessman. Um, so I think I really need to spend more time on that things that I got to take away from, um, those obvious goals. Um, so maybe I would probably, so again, back to your question, I might, maybe I would have told myself that earlier maybe this would happen early, but again, um, I have no regrets in terms of kind of where, how things are playing out right now. I think I'm, of course I'm in a good, good spot right now. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe take care of my knees a little better so they don't hurt as much. <laughs> wear the pads when you're doing when you're shooting on people i i i had big i had my senior year i had big like big red fluffy pads and i would bang up my knee pr- pretty good um but i would say pr- probably it was i would probably work on my hamstrings a little more i was super quad dominant 
as a high schooler in college, maybe work on my hamstrings. That's another suggestion as I think as the ideas keep rolling in. Um, but I would say, yeah, for the, for the most part, kind of focus on what's important because there's always going to be a good party or a good time to hang out with friends, but like some of the goals and some of those things are, are, are only achievable within a kind of a short window. So go after what you want. Solid advice. Well, I think that's all the time I want to take away from you today. Of course, I, I, of course, appreciate taking the time, and ho hopefully, again, this is helpful for your listeners. And of course, they, if they have any, any any questions, they can always you can tell them to reach out to me here on social media, and I'll, I'll do my best to help. I will do. Thank you, and uh, I'll I'll post this on our YouTube as well. I can I can Ooh. tag your YouTube on there. Oh, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, it just can't it just can't be, dude? Can't be doing a lot of things and. Except on great name. Except on TikTok, um, can be dude can be on TikTok, because for some some reason I kept they wouldn't let me do just can be dude. They kept putting a three on there, so I just added another can be on there, so it all fits. So yeah, can be doing throughout even on Reddit, Twitter, but I, I don't use Reddit or Twitter too much. But I just started getting on Reddit, which is pretty interesting. I like it. It's a fun place to be on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So when when we post this on YouTube, I'll I'll put all your links and everything in there. Thank you, boss. Thanks for, thanks for your time and have a good day. Best of luck with everything. Thank you, sir. You too.